was so sorry. Hey, thanks, Pat. Hey, I'm Tony and I'm Bobby. Bobby Rogers. And you're from Dallas. Dallas. Very sensitive about it, right? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I didn't know that. Thank you for coming. Well, Joan, very nice to have a chance to meet you. I have not met you before, although I certainly know your work. And uh, that everybody is going to know your work even more from this film. What a magnificent performance. Congratulations. Thank you, Barbara. Very nice. Yes. I suppose the key to your character is that one phrase, that one sentence where they say, you majored in college in beautiful. In college, you majored in beautiful. Would you say that's the key to your character? Yes, and you know, it does write some splendid words sometimes, doesn't it? That's, that was a particular one in my speech, I think. The, um, uh, the whole film, of course, is, has a lot of humor, but it, it has some real serious, meaty things to say about the relationship between the mother and the daughter, and also about Marsha's relationship with you and with her other close friend, played by James Coco. You have one scene where you really have to let it all out, your innermost feelings about her, where you tell her that she's a real pain. Now, was that scene written, Joan, or did you and Marsha really have to work to get that all out? Or was it in the script? You know, you don't have to really work with him. You know, he, he's this person who walks around the set and writes. He, and he's writing a play while you're doing it this film. You so I've seen Marsha tell him, so he started on something new. So he is watching and listening and not forgetting anything ever said by anybody all the time of his life. I mean, that's the kind of writer he is, apparently. But uh, I, I mentioned to someone else that the first reading we had was at their home. And uh, it's one of those splendid Bel Air, slightly intimidating houses, you know, with real Picasso's in the mind. Well, we all sat down, and uh, when I did the third act, and, or the, uh, the end that scene we're talking about, I later cornered him, and he's a rather formative fellow to me, anyway. and I said, Mr. Simon, the speech at the end, I don't think I would say uh, I would be able, I, I cannot put that together in my mind, I just can't agree with it. Um, it was written that she says to me, listen, Toby, you and I are both failures and we're both these. I said, no. And I said, don't, don't say that to me. And I thought, are you kidding? I can't do that. I would just be angry. I want to kill him. So, um, in fact, I'm still very moved by that speech. And uh, he said, well, that's because you're not Toby. So I thought, well, I tried, you know what I mean? And then I said my piece, and I'm committed to this, and I tried to make it. Well, needless to say, we, I had other work in between, and then two months later, we began the film. And I got the new script, and it had been changed. So Neil Simon could be changed. And my, the rumors I had heard was that it was all pretty much written in stone, and uh, he knew where the last one, and he knew where the, and so on. And he has a really, I think, terrific ear, and sort of rhythm to the speech. He, you can't change it. At least I don't want to change it once I've learned it a certain way, because it has a build and so on. Anyway, uh, he indeed was quite agreeable to the change that you see on the screen. And that is, I think, ultimately, the speech that every one of us wants to make to anyone who we love, who appears to be destroying themselves. The impotence and the fury and, uh, and the rage. It's really, I think, the, the long rage, rage against the night. We might go into the darkness of that dark night. And uh, that's the death of uh, Dylan's, uh, of, uh, well, I guess, really not entirely for the time. Is point, it Dylan Thomas? It's Dylan Thomas' yeah. poem to his father's death. And that impotence when someone is dying or going about committing their own death, uh, that I think all of us have in us. We all, what do you do? You cannot stop anyone from 
doing away with himself. So that speech for me, I must say, when I came off the set, we did it up in that balcony. Absolutely the best set I've ever seen. New York City, I just kept wanting to go down, down off the set into Manhattan because it looks like that. It really looked like Manhattan. The little cars moving on the bridge, like, oh, the set designers are throwing over. Right? Anyway, I love this particular set. And I would go off it, and people who were just having coffee on the side were crying because they simply heard the singing. They didn't see it. They weren't allowed up on the set. But my full fury, and I think the speech I've always wanted to make to my father and to all the various alcoholics I know in the world that we all know, that we all have in our life, is something I, I, I poured into that. So I'm real, I really uh, have a very warm spot for me in my heart because I didn't just say his words. He somehow gave me the voice I needed. Did you tell him that your father was an alcoholic? Well, what, I shouldn't say that, and I should be really fair to my father. He simply drank excessively. Uh, and uh, he appeared to be alcoholic to me. Later, I found that he was dying of a brain tumor for about 10 years. You know, it took a long time. My father was a very strong man. He's six foot four, 225 pounds. And uh, there was never any alcohol in our house. It's just my father was Irish. He was an immigrant. It was uh, customary in my father's family to have a lot of um, be a pail of beer was on the table. That was something done in 1919. My, both my parents were immigrants. My mother was from Italy, my father from Ireland. My mother's family being, of course, entirely different from me. So the, uh, the color that I got at home, I'm, I'm this curious combination of things, street person and elegant person. And, and I, I really hate the labels because I know they lie, and they don't reveal to us all that we should have about a person. We, we see someone with a pink glass and earrings, and we assume certain things that are not correct, and they're also, they're not interesting. They're just the first peel on the menu. And we're all so many things, and I sit here in my coffees and my hair and my nose, and you think I'm a certain thing, but I am a Martian and uh, a nun and uh, an infomaniac and uh, over 40 dying beauty that's pacing it together and uh, right. like a youthful uh, You know, so there's so many. What I, what I mean is we are so much that we don't appear to be when we look at each other. Could I add one more thing to that written? One heck of an actress. <laughs> Joan, I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's good to speak with you. Thank you so much. You're going to need to feel so I love you. Uh, if I can just turn around for some reverses and do I shift out of here or do I stay? You can stay with me. And I, I don't need to for I mean, you don't need to go out for it. I'm, I'm used to talking to doorknobs and mm -hmm. I love it. Thanks for Tell me when you're ready. Uh, a, a, a few reactions and then two questions. Okay. Uh, Oh, that, like so? Yeah. Yeah. Any questions there? There's a line in this film that seems to be the key to your character. The line, in college, she majored in beautiful. Would you, would you say that is the key to your character, Joan? Um, the big speech between you and Marcia in this movie toward the end, when you just you are so full of venom and you're so angry with her and you tell her she is a real pain. Now, was that all written there or was it something you and Marsha had to work on? You're saying then that Neil Simon really will change his mind about something he's written?
Joe, can I add just one more thing to that litany? One heck of an actress. Thank you, Jim. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.